Okay. Yes. Happy days. Happy yes, days. Happy day. <laughs> yes. So um, we can start now. You can give your intro. Um, uh, we we talked before. Um, uh, we've been here about a little bit about the group. So Kenny knows about what's going on with us. And uh, Kenny, the stage is yours. Over to me. Thank you very much indeed, Asif. So first of all, guys, thank you so much for allowing me um, to come along and speak to you tonight. Um, before I, I weighed in through six pretty incredible single cast, cast strength drums. I better tell you a wee bit about who Dramore are and, and what we are. So my name's Kenny McDonald. Um, I am part of a two-person team that run Dramore, um, just myself and my wife, Victoria. So obviously you can tell who the boss is and you're not talking to him. Um, very much Victoria is the brains of the organisation. I just do as I'm told. Um, Dramore as a company, we've been on the go since 2013, but we started as export agents working for um, independent Scotch distillers to take them into new countries, new marketplaces, and we would help them find the right, okay. the, the right route to market, all these kind of things to staff training, stuff like that. Um, subsequently, that, that grew, it grew really well. And my biggest client at the time, Ian McLeod Distillers, came to me and asked, would I like to, the exact words were, travel the world drinking whiskey with interesting people and they would pay me for it. So uh, you can imagine after I stopped rolling about laughing, I said, hey, yes, please, I'd love to do that. Which actually got me my first ever trip to Israel to Whiskey Live in Tel Aviv. Um, I was fortunate to do that for Oh, a good nine years. But there came a time where, you know, we decided if, if we want to move this forward, it's time to start bottling. And in 2019, we released our first ever Dramore um, single cash release. Um, just in time for the pandemic, obviously, the next year for the world to fall off its access. But funnily enough, we did not too bad out of it. And since then, Dramore has grown quite a bit. We bottle, obviously, single cast, cast strength whiskey, but also the same with rum, with Armagnacs, and this year later on, our first Cognacs and Calvados as well. So little by little, we're growing, we're expanding our horizons, but at the heart of it, it's always going to be whiskey. And, and that's what we're going to look at tonight, folks. Um, at the moment, I've got, I don't know who I've got on, I've got a black screen, so I don't know who's with me and who's not. Excuse me a wee second, and I'll switch to gallery, where I see, oh, terrifying faces, right? Okay, I should probably go back to the black screen. Where am I? Uh, so that's a little bit about who we are. Please, through the evening, and I know that, you know, you've been fantastic to, to mute everything off, and it saves a lot of confusion when there's a huge amount of people talking at one time. But if, as we go through the evening, if anyone has any questions they want to ask or any comments that they want to make, please feel free to stop me. Jump in. Always remember, folks, this is your night. It's not about me, it's about you. And I want you to enjoy it, and I want you to get as much out of it as you can. <laughs> uh, I had a little bit of a technical glitch earlier on, so I'm on an iPad rather than a laptop which means I'm not ignoring you and looking way over here. It's just weird. I'm looking at the screen, but the camera's over there. So it looks like I'm at a strange angle, so I apologise for that. So, sorry. Fine, I, have ask. Question, I have one question before we start. Go for it. Are we going to meet you at uh, Whiskey Live Israel? Yes. <laughs> The flights are already booked, my friend. I am I am on my way. Uh, I'm very, very much looking forward to coming back. This will be my my third trip over to Israel. And I have, I have been lucky enough that Oren, last time we were over, kind of took me on a little bit of a tour. We went up to the Golden no. Hill, David up in Milani. Um, I had a really good friend who was getting married in Tel Aviv, so well, Jaffa actually, and we, we spent a wonderful night having a great time in Jaffa, 
it is a country that, you know, the more that I have the opportunity to, to visit Israel, the more I understand of it and the more I kind of fall in love with it. So I'm very much looking forward to getting back out. If for no other reason than we've had six solid weeks of rain. This is the first night I've seen sunshine in about six weeks. So hopefully you guys can do something about that for me. I trust you to give me sunshine. So if everyone is quite happy, we'll start. So we're going to look at six different drams this evening. One of which I believe is a mystery dram. I'd love to tell seven, you about seven. 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 Yeah. seven. One, Include two, the including the mystery it's seven. Four, five, six. It is seven. You're right. You're spoiled. You are spoiled. And you know, for the life of me, I've got a little note here about what the mystery dram is. And I can't remember what it is. So I better check before I actually start talking about the wrong thing. Um this is this is Dramo's professionalism at its best that you're seeing here. Is slap bang at the beginning, me wondering what the hell I'm talking about. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Got it. Happy days. So, one of the things before we actually start drinking anything that I did want to say, um, we've got um, Oren with us this evening. Oren is my distributor in Israel um, through Alphabet Whiskies. All the whiskies that we're going to look at this evening are available. They're on orangealphabetwhiskey.com website. And tonight and tonight only, thanks to this fine man's generosity, if you use the code DRAM20, you'll get a 20% discount on the night. That's not bad. Certainly a damn sight more than I would have given you. That's for sure. So that's enough about Scottish people and being stingy. So we will move on to dram number one of the evening. And we're going to start with a distillery which I've got a lot of love for. Um, I don't particularly have a lot of love for its current owners, but we'll talk about that as we go on. We're going to go up the west coast of Scotland um, to Loch Harbour and to Ben Nevis Distillery. Now, when I talk about these whiskies, the one thing I always like to do is give you a little bit of background and history about the distillery itself. Once we've we've had a look at that, then we can have a look at the whiskey, the oak that we've used to mature this particular dram or finish this dram. And then you guys can tell me how you feel about the flavor that you're gonna get out of this one. Unfortunately, all the whiskies that you're drinking this evening are long gone in Scotland. So I am still sitting as I was with a gentleman earlier on when I was talking with a bottle of Iron Brew, which some of you may know is equally as important in Scotland as whiskey. Unfortunately, it's not as much fun. So we're so, starting with, drum, uh, uh, with Ben Nevis, yes? We are starting with Ben Nevis and we are going to start with an 11-year-old Ben Nevis. This particular one is finished in Pedro Jimenez Sherry. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the oak uh, after we've been through the distillery. So Ben Nevis Distillery dates back to 1825. Oh, I've got loads of feedback coming through from somewhere. Who's on what? Good man, thank you. Um, going back to 1825, so very much one of the older distilleries in Scotland. Licensing, official licensing for distilling in Scotland was only introduced in the winter, the, the very early months of 1823. So you can see this was right at the beginning of officially, legally making whiskey. Um, it was created by a man called John McDonald, known as Long John due to the fact that he was a big lad. He was about six feet eight, apparently. So the, the kind of height that you've got to duck coming through the door especially back in the 1820s when most people were tiny. Um, nowadays, this is a distillery that creates 2 million litres of spirit a year. Nowhere near that in Long John's day. John McDonald ran the distillery successfully from the Alta Vane burn coming down off of the uh, Ben Nevis. 
through till 1856, where sadly it struggled, um, I think reading between the lines with mental health, and he was found dead very close to the burn. It was then taken over by his son, Donald. No one can ever say that us McDonald's have not got a good sense of imagination when it comes to naming children. Donald, son of Donald. There's a lot of Donald McDonald's in the world. So Donald takes over in 1856. Now, Donald, by this time, unlike his father, John, Donald had a good business head on him. Donald knew where he wanted to go with this. And by 1878, he'd opened up a second distillery just across from Ben Nevis. This one, again, going back to this great sense of imagination, was just the Nevis distillery. And it worked away through till the, the kind of 18, 1920s where uh, it closed down. Nowadays, you can still see before you drive to Ben Nevis distillery, if you look on your left, on the way up to the highlands, you will see buildings with the pagoda roofs, and that's exactly where the maltings for Nevis Distillery once sat. So it sits in Clan Donald's hands. The MacDonald family owned this all the way through to 1955, where it's taken over by a man called Joseph Hobbs. He's actually Welsh, but made his name in Canada as a circus man. He was a showman, big showman. In World War I, he'd been a, one of the world's first ever fighter pilots and actually recorded having a dogfight with a, the Red Baron, the great German pilot of the day. Obviously, both of them survived that one. And Joseph came over as a very flashy businessman, someone who knew how to dazzle the crowds and built the Ben Nevis distillery that we know today. If any of you get the chance to come over, and you see Ben Nevis Distillery, it is huge. But when you go in to actually see what's made in it, it's actually mostly empty. Hobbs built this thing, but it was a folly. It was all for show and not actually anywhere near the size it had to be. Remembering it's only creating 2 million litres a year. That's not a big throughput for a big Scotch whiskey distiller. So it goes through a few different hands. It, it has mixed success over the years. And in 1989, it falls into the hands of its current owners, who are Nika, Japanese whiskey. This is where I go off on a tangent and have a huff. Nika are not good for Ben Nevis. Nika own three distilleries. They own Yochi. They own Makigio and they own Ben Nevis. Yochi Distillery was opened in the 1950s by a man called Masataka Takatsuru. He's very much the father of Japanese whiskey and a good guy who learned all his trade over here in the, the late 1917-1918 era. Um, unfortunately, what they now have is the habit of having spirit distilled in other countries, moved to Japan and labelled up as Japanese whiskey. So three quarters of that two million litre a year goes straight to Japan. All that you make spirit goes straight over there, most of which becomes Nika from the barrel. So if you're drinking Nika from the barrel and you think, well, that's delicious. Yes, it is, because it's Ben Nevis. That's what you're drinking. Now, fortunately, a group of Japanese distillers a few years ago, led mainly by Chichibu, got together and said, look, this has got to stop because we are genuine Japanese distillers. And at the time, they put a voluntary sticker on their bottle stating, we are a member of the Japanese Whiskey Distillation Organization or whatever. That's now passed into law. So what you will find with bottles like Nika from the Barrel, it doesn't say Japanese whiskey on it. It just gives you a very strong impression that it's Japanese by writing everything in Japanese. But th that's where we are. So, yeah, I'm not overly impressed with its current owners. Uh, I was very lucky when I first started in the industry to have a man called Colin Ross, who was then the, the managing director at Ben Nevis, take me under his wing. He was a fantastic mentor, a lovely, lovely man, a real gentleman. Uh, sadly, we lost Colin a few years ago, um, and it will never, ever be the same without him at the helm. 
that's for sure. But you can't mention Ben Nevis without mentioning Colin's name. So we're actually going to look at two Ben Nevises this evening, one after the other, which is a good way for me to skip talking about one distillery. Two distilleries, two samples, one distillery. I'm just getting lazy. I can't help it. So number one, folks, Ben Nevis, 11-year-old, Pedro Jimenez finish, 54% alcohol in this one. Wow. As you will know, I know you guys are whiskey geeks. So as you know, in Scotland, unlike what you'll find with somebody like Milk and Honey, for example, where as the years go by, their whiskey will strengthen due to the fact that the humidity and heat that you've got, more water evaporates than alcohol. Because we don't have anywhere near the kind of temperatures you have, our alcohol evaporates faster than our water. So our whiskey gets weaker over the years. So 54% is not a bad number for an 11-year-old dram. Now, when we get our whiskies, 95% of what we buy will be second, maybe even third refill casks. There's nothing coming out of the oak. The spirit is great. I know the spirit is good because I know the distillery and I know the style of the distillery. But when I first started in this game, I swore I would never buy a cask unless I had the opportunity to sample it first. Had I stuck to that, I would have bought exactly two casks. You don't get samples. It doesn't happen. You've got to buy blind. So I've just got to use my knowledge of the distilleries and the style of whiskey they make to make my decision on what I buy. We will then get home and we will be confronted with sample bottles to try to see what quality is in there. It's then up to me to decide, is it good enough to bottle? But to be good enough, that spirit must be exceptional. Dramor does not bottle good or okay. If it's just good, that's not good enough. If it's exceptional, I'll bottle it. And you'll see that as we go through these drums tonight. If it's only good, I've got to work out, okay, what do I need to do to make this dram exceptional? And it's working out what oak best fits the flavour profile of the spirit. And most importantly, for how long? Don't leave it too long. When I transfer that spirit into new oak, the oak and the spirit are going to go to war. Eventually, the oak is going to win. If it's a very gentle, very delicate spirit like Speyside Distillery, the spirit will concede quickly. However, Ben Nevis is a big, full-bodied, robust spirit. This will take longer for the oak to wear the spirit down. But eventually, the spirit will bend the knee and concede to the oak. It's my job to make sure that that is the time that I take that spirit out of the oak. I never want the spirit to be consumed completely by that oak, because if I do that, I lose the character and the style of that spirit. With this particular Pedro Jimenez cask, that's one you've got to be very careful of. Pedro Jimenez as a sherry is one of these really sweet, heavy, sticky dessert sherries. If you leave it too long, that really heavy, sickly sweet note is going to permeate right the way through this dram, and you're going to lose all sense or style of what Ben Nevis actually is. We cannot have that. I want people lifting this glass, and the minute they know us, they go, I know what that is, that's Ben Nevis. And from there on in, the oak should complement the spirit, not kill the spirit. So, over to you guys, what do you think of what we have in this glass? I'd be really keen to hear. I, I want to ask a question about Why are we what we're drinking right, right now. Because, as you said, it's also very important for me from the uh, uh, whiskeys that I drink that uh, they won't lose the whiskey DNA. So yeah. if you get them uh, an overwhelming sherry or overwhelming um, uh, any kind of um, uh, brandy or um, uh, whatever that is going on over there, it will kill the whiskey. This yeah. one is PX, and PX is very harsh and very strong. If you, you tell me right now to, uh, to taste this, blind test, taste this, I would never guess this is, I, I would guess this is sherry. 
but usually when you get pH cherry, you get uh, uh, the color is wrong. Uh, uh, the taste is there, but almost there, you know, because it, this is very unusual for pH to be like this, because we, usually when you drink pH, it's like uh, 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 unfiltered uh, oil, or something like this, you know, exactly, yes. exactly, exactly. This is very unusual, and I like it, because you still have the DNA of the whiskey, it's not overwhelming, it's not yeah. one-dimensional sweet, like uh, 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 usually what they do with the uh, uh, tamdu and mecca strength. They kill it with one ton, one thousand tons of uh, sherry. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, I am. This is ex exceptional. This is the way whiskey should be done. <laughs> I, I, I think the most important thing for me as an independent bottler is always, always to remember, I didn't make this stuff. The men and women of Benevis Distillery, or whichever distillery I'm working with, Thank they're the me. ones responsible for making that spirit, not me. Yes. So as an independent bottler, it's absolutely key that I showcase their spirit to the very best of my abilities. If you go to any distillery or any, any whiskey shop, you will find the core ranges from any distillery. Actually, Ben Nevis is difficult because they do take so much to Japan. It's not easy to buy Ben Nevis. The vast majority of Ben Nevis you'll find is from people like me, from independent bottlers. But the, the big difference between what we do and what the distillery do, they, they will be tied to creating a core range, a 10, a 12, a 15, an 18, a 21, whatever. They don't really have room to experiment Every now and again, you'll get a, a distillery special edition, but it's not for public consumption. You've got to go to the distillery to get that, to take it away. But they'll use it as something to entice the whiskey geek or atty like us and because they want that bottle. For me, I'm fortunate where I get the opportunity to showcase their whiskey in a slightly different way, but all the time remembering that if I disrespect that spirit, I'm doing a massive injustice to that distillery, and I cannot have that. Because this is not about me. It's about how good that spirit is, and then showcasing it in a slightly different light. Can, can, you, tell us, uh, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, this is pro, uh, second fill, uh, first fill cherry, uh, how long was it in the, uh, for the finish? Because this is very interesting for me. Three, three months? Three months. Three months, and this is the second the fill, fill, third fill? That's it, it's a first fill PX. First fill PX? It's first. Wow. It's first but that's this really short finish, remembering you've got a big, heavy spirit in there. Yeah. Normally, if, if I was looking to put a major footprint of a flavor and color from a cask into a Ben Nevis, mm -hmm. I'd be at least six to nine months, at least... Good. Whereas I'm dealing with a first fill Pedro Jimenez. I want I, more of these. <laughs> hmm? I want more of these. <laughs> Good man. Yeah. Uh, well, funnily enough, um, this is slightly different, but that's the first of our summer bottlings, which we just got um, yesterday. And that is a 10 year old Ben Nevis. This particular one's a Palo Cortado, and it is at 57.4. It is stunning i could i don't need a glass for this i could drink it with a straw it's just so damn good okay i'll send you the address at the end of the just send it to me okay <laughs> just make sure make sure the orange listening he's going to start taking pre-orders that's the important thing so yeah with, with this particular dram if if i leave this too long and that's one of the issues that i've got with some independent bottlers that there are a lot of us on the market now. So what makes them more different from all these other guys? Some are fantastic. If I look at people like Adelphi, for example, I hold Adelphi in massive high regard. They were very much the benchmark for Victoria and I when we first started doing this project. If I look at people who have got great history behind them, like Berry Brother and Rudd, Gordon McPhail, Cadden heads, incredible independent bottlers. But there are a lot out there who don't take the time, the care, the attention 
they, they're just in it for a quick buck. And either they will buy a cask and irrespective of what's in that cask, put it in a bottle and sell it. Will it sell? Yeah, it's Scotch whiskey. It's always going to sell. But are they showcasing that spirit to its best? Hell no. Or you get another school who at least realise that they've got to re-rack that whiskey into something else to bring it to life. But they don't pay attention to this. And this is where you get these black whiskies, which have been massacred by huge, big, fortified wines. And you know what? On a freezing cold winter's night in Scotland with a roaring log fire, one or two of these can be lovely. But if you love sherry that much, just buy a bottle of sherry. It's cheaper. You know, that's, that's all you do. It the same. Sorry? It doesn't taste. No, that it is does, true. It, it doesn't, doesn't taste, taste the same. same. But well, what you to do? Jerry. Sit with a yeah, famous. Yeah, but it's so much more cheaper. Much more. Sit with a famous grouse and a glass of sherry, and just sit intermittently. Do it that way. Uh, but for me, a good whiskey is all about a balance. And I think with this eleven-year-old Pedro Jimenez dram, I think we've got the balance right. So. Over to you guys. What do you think of this one? Silence. This is this is the bit where you talk, guys. Well, I have already tried the second one, the Man in the State. Oh, I tried see to, that. I tried to taste one. them. Yeah, I tried to taste them uh, one uh, near the other, and for me, it's the the eleven. It's, it's much, 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 much more. Um, Pleasant, regular, like smoother, smoother. It's not a word that we really like in Israel for whiskey, but um, yeah, I, I really liked it. And I'm not from, uh, not strong with the sweeter ones. That that's it's, that's good to hear, Mike. I'm that Rotom. How are we, sir? Nice to see hey, you. Are you. Hi, Bill. Hi. No bad. I was waiting. That he's like a bad penny. He always turns up somewhere. I knew he'd be here at some stage. You've missed nothing, mate. Just me talking nonsense. Okay. Just the normal. Just the oh, normal. Hey. So, How Mike, are you, my friend? Uh, you're the first guy. So I, I, I'm really happy what you're saying, Mike. Um, hi, Kenny. Hey, who's shouting hi, Kenny? <laughs> Who's on? This is Dro Hartman. Where are you? Dro, who are we? Sorry, you're, you're, oh, all I can see, you're, you're hiding in the dark, my friend. Uh, yeah. You're hiding uh, in the dark. I can't see you. So, do you know, I, just out of interest, you know, it's interesting that, you know, the first two whiskies are obviously the Nevises. Did, did anybody else try them together the way Mike has done? So, yes. uh, I'll give you a little kind of picture of what we're looking at with the second one. So this is a bit younger. This is an eight-year-old, so we're three years younger than the last one. But this one's a little bit stronger. We're moving up to 56.7 here. And again, we've finished this with Sherry, but we finished this in what is my favourite cask to work with, which is Paolo Cartado. Mm -hmm. Now, Paolo Cartado, for me, brings a real creaminess to our drama. Not necessarily with Ben Nevis, because the way of Ben Nevis will, will fight that off. But Paolo Cartado, and we will look at it, I think, slightly. Will we look at it later? I think we will. We'll find out. Um, again, back to the professionalism here. Um, yeah, but it's, it's an incredibly interesting cask, yes. because of all the sherries in the world, you cannot make... Paolo Cartado. Paolo Cartado happens. It's an accident. Paolo Cartado will start off life as a phenol or an Amontillado sherry. When they're making this sherry, they will want the, the leaves, the, the, the floor, the, the yeast to sit on top of the wine as it ferments. For some unknown reason, the, the, the yeast sinks but it stays active. And if that happens, that bodega will call a festival day. 
they've got a Paolo Cartado. They have tried to work out how they can make this happen. They've tried to artificially make it happen. Doesn't work. And no one can explain why, for the hundreds of different runs of Amontillados or Finos they've made, once in a blue moon, they decide it's going to take a dive. But that is a big festival day for them because they have a Paolo Cartado. So these casks are not that easy to find because it's not that common a, a sherry. And when you do find them, they're not cheap casks either. They're expensive oak to buy. To give you a rough idea, when I started in the industry, if I wanted to buy an ex-bourbon cask, I could get it a good first fill bourbon for about £80. Nowadays, that's going to cost me closer to £180. However, if I want to buy a good share cask, yeah, we're, we're closer to 1000 to £1,200 for that cask. So people will ask me, well, why is whiskey so expensive? Well, there you go. That's just the oak on its own. Never mind anything else. This particular one for me, the, the youth of the Ben Nevis at eight years old, Ben Nevis, when it's young, is still quite punchy. It's quite aggressive. I like that. I really like that. And you can see from the, the difference between just three years and the two drams, that extra three years and 11-year-old has really mellowed it down. Whereas with the eight-year-old, you're still taking a sip and you're getting that whack. Wow, what the hell was that? But it's a whack that I really like. And after I've taken it, I thought, wow, do that again, please. This, this is a perfect hit to your face, man. This is perfect. You happy with that, sir? Yes, yes. This is amazing. Three, yes. years, three years younger and punchy and... Uh, uh, it's amazing. It's amazing. I, I, I just loved this dram, but I think that I know Ben Nevis as a spirit really well. I know the qualities in there. You're always going to pick out kind of walnut notes and stuff like that coming from Ben Nevis, from you make spirit through to a 40 year old. But this particular Paolo Cartado, I think, really lifts it and, and it makes it an exciting whiskey for me. You know, that I'm a firm believer that every single dram, especially single cast drams, have got a story that they want to tell us. But us as whiskey drinkers, we don't listen. We just drink. But if we take time with that dram, and obviously we're not going to listen with ease, we're going to listen here, 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 and most importantly, here. We get to know that dram. We get to understand its story. And when it's finished, we miss it as an old friend. But you never know, you might come across that old friend again years down the line. And the minute you lift it to your nose, bang, you remember exactly who and what that is because you took time to get to know it. And that is the beauty of single cask whiskies. I, I just, I, I think it's magic. I love the fact that, you know, and I fully appreciate what Mike was saying earlier on, where he really liked that Pedro Jimenez influence coming through in the 11-year-old. It definitely is softer. And yet, with other people, Peter, and as I've saying there, oh, this eight-year-old is brilliant. That's what's great about whiskey. There is no right and no wrong answer. What one yeah. person loves, another person doesn't. Sorry. No, it's fine. And just like interesting for me is if it was a blind tasting and you would have told me that the two of them, it's the same distillery, I would never believe it. And no. the first one, the first one actually remind me of the Nika. And I'm a big sucker of the Nika from the barrel. It's a must whiskey at my home. But, yeah, I love it. And maybe because it's been nervous. No, but um, <laughs> but I'm saying that there's for me, these two. Blind tasting, I will never guess it's the same distillery. I I can pick up the same, but I'm a professional alcoholic. Yeah. So as a professional alcoholic, I am really in tune with what's going on in there. And I think for me, I mean, it's impossible for me, obviously, to do any of these things blind because I'm the one that put them together in the first place. Um, and because of that, I've already pre-programmed my brain to look for certain things in these. So it's really interesting 
um, Afrat, to hear you say that because it allows me an insight that I genuinely cannot get when I taste these things. But what you really want to do, you know, when you're bringing this different oak to the table, is bring out a different side of the character that's in there. So we've obviously managed that if you're not identifying one with the other. The one thing I'm really keen to make sure, we didn't drown out the spirit with the oak here, though, did we? It wasn't all wood. I, I don't think so, Kenny, to be honest. Uh, but I do agree uh, with, with the folks here said uh, it's two different whiskeys completely. And but to be honest, for me, every Ben Nevis that I ever tasted was different, completely. It's a different, it, it likes, it's from different distillery. Is that so? They're all good, yeah. they're all good. Well, but I think one, one of the main things, in it, and it goes back to the fact that the vast majority of Ben Nevis that you will try is coming from independent bottlers rather than classic distillery range. Because for the last 20 years, they've not really had a classic distillery range. You exactly. know, to, to buy a Ben Nevis 10-year-old in Scotland was unheard of. You couldn't do it. You couldn't find it. Yeah. So that in turn leaves a kind of a gap in our whiskey knowledge of, well, what is Ben Nevis? Because every time you try it, it's coming from a different independent bottler who will have a different ethos and a different idea about how it should be framed. So it becomes very difficult to be able to identify what Ben Nevis really is. I'm fortunate where we've got a lot of casks of Ben Nevis laid down from New Make Spirit. So from the very beginning, I, I understand and, and know the distillate. And when you get to know that distillate, you can then trace it through each Ben Nevis you try. Because you understand, you know, it was mentioned earlier on, the DNA of that whiskey. But if you've never had the opportunity to try that new make and understand the core flavour profile that's in there, it's very, very difficult to pick up one Ben Nevis from Cadden Heads and then another Ben Nevis from Douglas Lane and then another Ben Nevis from Lady of the Glen. And you've got no idea what Ben Nevis is meant to taste like. So hopefully the one thing I have done is showcase them respectfully is the most important thing for me. But giving you two drams that you've sat back and looked at and thought, wow, they're good. I like this. And certainly there's a lot of smiles on the screen that I can see. To be outside. honest, Kenny, to be honest, we were, um, we were very much um, disagree on which one is better. Like Great. Father is the eight for me is the eleven and Probably. completely you know he just said to to me I think it's the great drum uh to, to sit in front of the fire not with that we do have a fireplace I was gonna say here, but you guys don't need to do that too often you know right. it's it's such a, a a whiskey with a kick that yeah. that. It, it, I may be influenced by the fact that the, the 11 year old was so smooth and so silky that the, the 8 year old one was such a, a bombastic strike in my palate. I may be influenced by that, but I think from, uh, if I were to choose which one I would want to buy a bottle of, I would take the 8 year old one. Yeah, I, I'm, if it, I love both of them. But if I was painted into a corner, I'd be the same as you. I'd be going for the eight. I want something that's coming out swinging, you know? And I'm no, like, come on, bring it on. Let me see this. It attacks your pellets, but it doesn't go uh, go down your throat as, as it is burning. It's, no. it's still smooth, but it still strikes you hard. It's, it's I yeah. don't know, like a, a tough love uh, punch from your father. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it's It's... Although there's a there's a huge amount of body to it, there's that that youthfulness to it. There's no aggression in it. You know, it doesn't attack you. And you will have some of these drams, and you take a sip, and it goes down like paint stripper, and you go, "Ha, huh, God, what are you trying to do to me?" This does not do that. But what it does do for me is it leaves a big impression. 
you know, and, and, and it asks me questions. And I love a dram that asks me questions. Some of my favourite whiskies are ones that on the first nose and the first taste, and someone will say, well, what do you think? I don't know yet. I might like it. I might not. Give me a wee minute to, to actually start working on this, and then I'll tell you. And this one asked me questions. But when I got to understand it, when I got to listen to the story it was telling me, I thought, oh, you and me are friends. I like this drama. Um, but anyway, listen, we could sit here all night talking about two Ben Nevises. In fact, the way I'm going, we are talking all night about two Ben Nevises. There are plenty of whiskeys to come. So, in the best Monty Python tradition, now for something completely different. And we will move on. And we are going a well away from Ben Nevis. We are traveling much more to the East Coast rather than the West. And we are going into the heart of Speyside, to the village of Rothis, where we find Glenrothes Distillery. I want, to, Rothis, I, I want to say one thing before we, you continue. Can we ask that? Yeah. It gives me a... Try, um, you, you have 20 ml of uh, whiskey. Try to leave a little bit uh, uh, whiskey in your glass and let it and continue to the, the rest of them because I went back to the first one right now and it changed it changed it 180 degrees to the other side. So I very much even recommend a splash of water it a what what even a splash of water was did magical for the for the for yes, the yes, yes. This, this is amazing again because you have a, a high ABV here you can play with it yep. if you don't want to add water right now you should add water. If you don't want to add water, just give it a little bit of time and just don't drink everything, just go with the flow and go back to it later. You know, it's an incredible good note. It's a really good point, Asaf, and well made. Um, and also, Dorg, perfect with water as well. You're right. And it's a, something that I should have touched on. You will find, especially when you're dealing with single cask whiskies, these react to oxidization in a very, very similar way that you would expect a really good quality wine to. That when you open that dram and you pour that dram straight from the bottle and you go to the nose and you taste it, it's going to be nothing like it would be if you give it 10 or 15 minutes to open up. I had a really good experience um, years ago. One of our first runs, I brought out a single cast, cast strength Aberlour. This had been sitting in Portuguese red wine. Spanish red wine? No, Portuguese. And I was desperate to try this. And we got our, our line samples home. And the first thing I did, straight from that Aberlour, opened it, poured it, quick nose, tasted it. And honestly, my reaction was, oh, what have I done? That's not what I wanted. Really disappointed in that. And I put it to one side. And I went through and I poured the rest of the drams and I tried each one, everything perfect. I was really happy with them. But I then walked around the house like a spoiled child. And I'm terrible when I'm a spoiled child. If I had a dog, I would have kicked it. That's the kind of mood I was in. As it is, the only other person in the house is Victoria. And I am nowhere near brave enough to think about kicking her. So I just walked about like a child, came back, sat down in my chair in my huff, staring at this Aberlour glass like it had abused me. I'm like, what have I done? And I lifted the glass again. Now, by this time, 10 minutes, 15 minutes have passed. And I went to the nose again and I thought, wait a minute, what's this? Night and day to what it was when I tried it first time round. It had stunning wild strawberry sweetness coming out of it. But just that little bit of tartness in there. I took a sip of it and thought, oh, wait a minute, this is phenomenal. And it was just having the patience to give it a little bit of time to breathe, to open up, to escape that bottle. And because I'm greedy, I didn't do it. So it's a really, really good point. Well made, Asaf. Thank you for that. And definitely, lads, you know, you're spot on with the water. For me, especially when we're dealing with sherry finishes, it is a bit of a hit and a miss. I think if we're dealing with ex-bourbon casks, 
we're always going to get something positive coming out of that teardrop of water. Sometimes for me, when we're dealing with good sherry oak, that teardrop of water can make the whiskey fall a little bit flat. Other times, it really opens it up. There is no rhyme or reason to why that works. For something like tonight, I would always advise you, always taste your whiskey neat first. If you like it, keep it going till you've got a little bit left and then try it with a teardrop. Whiskey's a toy, it's for us to play with. The more you play with it, the more you understand it. Anyway, back to Glenrothes. So 1879 sees the beginning of Glenrothes. And what a story Glenrothes has got. How this distillery is still operating, I do not know, because if I owned the thing, I would have given up years ago. So we will go through the history of catastrophic disasters that is Glenrothes Distillery. So it's built in 1878, but the first distillate runs on the 28th of the 12th, 1879. On that very same day, the Tay Bridge, which links the south and the north coast of the River Tay coming into Dundee, collapses with a train on it, drowning 92 people. So that's its opening day. We have opened, and all everyone's talking about is the Tay Bridge disaster. So it's now entwined with the opening day of Glenrothes Distillery. At the time, owned by a man called James Stewart, starts off as James Stewart and Co. And that goes on through to 1897, where it's taken over. They want to expand their malting floors, and there is a massive fire, and it burns the distillery at the ground. So, unperturbed, they rebuild it, and they get on with their distilling. And in 1922, during a further expansion project, there is a massive explosion which wipes out half the distillery. They lose 200,000 imperial gallons of spirit. That equates to 910,000 litres gone. Now, realistically, you know, that's, for some small distilleries, that's half a year's output. Gone. Vanished. Did they give up? Not at all. They rebuilt the distillery, cracked on in the 1962. The whole thing is wiped out by another massive fire. Now, I've got to be honest, I think by this time, I'm not a particularly religious person, folks, but I would be looking up thinking, someone's trying to tell me something here. This is the fourth time this bloody distillery has been wiped out. Am I doing something wrong? I should maybe give up and walk away. But none of it. They rebuilt the distillery in 1982 to what is now a very modern, incredibly well protected with fire protection, I can tell you that, distillery. And to this day, it keeps going. So it's worked well. Now that, uh, nowadays, it's, it's um, Edrington Group who own Glenrothes. Glenrothes as a single malt whiskey, the same as all single malts, really. We didn't have single malt whiskey on the market until the very late 1960s, really. That's the first time it start released properly or marketed as a drink. Up until then, every single distillery would be a packer distillery. By a packer, what I mean is it would be used, that single malt would be used as an ingredient to go into blended scotch. So the old black and whites, the Johnny Walkers, the White Horse, the famous Grouse, White Mackay, Bells, all of these very famous big brands. But Glenrothes has continued to do that all the way through until Edrington really came into play. There was very, very little of Glenrothes was released as single malt. Now this distillery puts out 5.2 million litres a year, folks. Only a tiny fraction of that is ever released as Glenrothes bottlings. So you don't see too much of it. It is there, it is available. But when you deal with Glenrothes as a single cask dram, this particular one sitting at 57%, it's a different animal to what you would get from the distillery. 
This particular one we have finished in an Amontillado sherry cask, and this time for four months. Asaf. Kenny. By the way. Orange. Kenny. I love Amontillado finishes. This is my favorite finish for, for all time. Yeah. Amontillado, it's, it's, it's rubbish. Amontillado itself is rubbish. You can't drink it. It's undrinkable, but with whiskey, it's it's a perfect match. Brilliant. But I, I must admit, when, when I, I'm not a big sherry fan when it comes to actually drinking sherry. And Fino and Amontillado are two of my least favorite sherries. Kenny. Hello, Oren. This is it's Chewy. not Amontillado, it's Amontillado. Amontillado. Double N's a Y in uh, Spanish. Stupid, uh, stupid Scottish. Yeah, I know. Amont we discussed it already. Amontillado. I, I exactly. did get it. Pedro Jimenez, right? Which I was quite pleased yeah. with. I will try to stick to Amontillado from now on. I apologize. Uh, yeah, it's it's not something that I could drink in its own. And yet the oak works so damn well with whiskey. And with this Glenrothes, I think it really brings this dram to life. Glenrothes if it's released at 40, 43%, for me, it's a little bit lifeless sometimes. It's a little bit soulless. It is difficult to find anything in there that's really going to grab your attention. And yet when you bring it out at its natural strength and you pair it off with the right wood, what a difference that makes. It really comes out, lights that whiskey up, a very, very different creature from what we had with the Ben Nevis. Glen Rothis, a classic Heart of Speyside whiskey, is a much lighter, much more gentle spirit than Ben Nevis is. This particular run, as I said, four months in the Sherry Oak. But this was a refill, a uh, second fill, I'm sorry, first refill Amontillado cask. So this wasn't a first fill cask, to recollection. Uh, so it just imparts enough of that really rich Spanish sunshine coming into the spirit. You get that light fruitiness coming in, which matches quite well with the Glenrothes style, which is pretty fruity anyway. I gotta but, say, I, mean, I, I absolutely don't agree with you. I think the whiskey ties well with the story since it's a whiskey with good intentions, but an awful result. I think it, it smells absolutely incredible. The smell, it's so sweet. It's so amazing. And yet the taste itself is so bitter and it lets the whole thing down absolutely doesn't mix well. That's my opinion. Are, are you sure that we're tasting the same whiskey? Because I think exactly the opposite. The opposite. Exactly. With three guys sitting here and, uh, and thinking that the nose is a little lack. Yeah. But when you taste it, it blows my mind. This is something that, uh, you know, maybe it needs time. I don't know. I think that water will kill the, the, the nose, but uh, completely. completely. Yeah. But the nose, a little bit, um, for me, it's a little bit uh, uh, downscale. I, I'm not sure. But when you taste it, then boom. You have something. I must that, mention, uh, I must weird. mention that uh, it, both the nose and the palate feel very herbal, very. It's like uh, I wrote, uh, it's like fortified uh, tea, uh, herbal tea or something. Green tea yeah, is very, exactly it's, what I thought. Yes, it's very herbal. Very herbal. You know, in there, yeah. Yes, I think I think to recollection on the tasting notes when when we're writing the tasting notes, that was one of the tasting notes that I picked out was tea, um, and that's classic Glenrothes as well. You do have that slightly herbaceous note. And I think it's fascinating. And this is what I love so much about whiskey, is that one person's going, hell no, that's no for me. And another person's going, that is out of this world. What are you talking about? And that's what makes whiskey, you know, is the fact that it's not that generic, one-size-fits-all product. It, it, a whiskey is only as good as what it means to you. I'm so... If, find the post here. <laughs> And, and funnily enough, you know, I'm I, I very much in the same um, boat as a staff to recollection with this one. As I say, you know, we don't have any of these left in Scotland, so sadly, I don't have the ability to to drink them along with you, which I would normally do. Um, 
But one of the things that, and, and this is just going by memory with this dram, was, was one of these ones that lied to me on the nose. Now, I know you might be thinking it's lied the other way around, but for me, I lifted it, I nosed this whiskey, and I thought, it's not very much there. It's, it's not really given me a lot. And then I took a sip and went, oh, wait a minute, this is brilliant. And the, there are times with the whiskeys the other way around. You know, I run a big whiskey club in Glasgow, have done for nine years, and we have tried probably into the thousands of whiskeys by now. And there are certain whiskies that I'll lift and I'll go to the nose and I'm really excited about them. I've never tried this, right? Let's have a look. And the nose is wonderful. You go, oh, I cannot wait for this. And you take a sip and shoo, there's nothing there. And I thought, what a letdown. This for me is the other way around. It tells you you're not going to get much out of it. But when you take that sip, the flavour just oh, builds. And you go, wow, that's stunning. So let's take a little straw poll. Who likes this and who doesn't? I think this might split the room a little bit. Not for you, lads. Okay, Doc. If Rat's happy, Sander? Sander? Are you there? Sander? Good, bad? Yes, no? Do we have time? Yes, we do. We're getting that. That's okay. Okay. In between. Think, then, Jack, about uh, about this. Uh, are you with us, Jack? Yes, I'm yeah. with you. I'm with what are you, you thinking, I... Jack? What? What What are you thinking? Oh, I thought it a uh, very, very good drum. The nose is very. Uh, it's a cl it exploded of uh, uh, a lot of uh, melted. Uh, uh, Guys, honestly, when you're talking, I know that English is not anybody's first language, and my English is not particularly good either. <laughs> if you if you want to speak in Hebrew, speak in Hebrew, please. Yeah, um, you can, you can, you can say speak in Hebrew. We, we please, are, because I will to, to guys, he doesn't speak English. You don't have to speak English as well. <laughs> can, can you speak Gaelic? Can he? No, not particularly well. Kimara uh, Hashik, Alistair. No, but he can speak Scots. Oh, right, can he? Can speak whiskey, oh, yeah. Un unfortunately, if I slip into the way I would normally speak at home, you will not have a clue what I'm saying. Because so I'm saying I'm, this is exactly when I was uh, living in Ireland, when people spoke, uh, were speaking to me, I understood when they were speaking to each other. No Nada. way, no way, nothing, nothing. I couldn't understand no. even a small bit of thing from the, the nothing. We um, Scottish and Irish, there, there is a, a Celtic bad habit of putting entire paragraphs into one word. We, we don't, and, and, and personally, we're just, we're, you know, we're, we're making sure we're not wasting energy by taking breaks all the time. Let's just get this over and done with. So, you know, a whole chapter comes out without taking a breath. Uh, and unfortunately, if you miss the beginning of it, you have no chance of catching up. So I will I will attempt to continue in my fairly poor English. But hey, we shall see. So let's say the Glenrothes was, I don't know, a mixed bag. A mixed bag. Um, some of you loved it. Maybe some of you know so much, but I'm happy with that. So we're moving on, and I've got to remember, looking at what the lineup was, I can't remember exactly where your mystery dram comes. No, now it's the Craig Elohi. Craig Elohi, then mystery. No. Yeah. The, the mystery no, drum will be at the end. The mystery drum will be at the end. No, 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 no. No? The end is the... Um... The very Number sweet uh, uh, Glenn Glasgow, and the, before that, the spitted the inch fat. Okay, it, it doesn't matter, but don't tell anyone what is, it is until after the. the no, not a word, not a word. What I would suggest is we definitely do the mystery dram before we move into inch fat, yeah. because yeah. The, the peat and the inch fat will throw 
the okay. flavour of the Mystery Dram quite dramatically. So, okay, doke So we're moving on, and we are going to the absolute heart of Speyside. We're going to Craig Elliki. Craig Elliki Distillery, 1891. This particular distillery puts through 4 million litres a year. So it's a big player. But again, you do not see a lot of it other than it's one classic, which is 13 that they release, um, which is always quite an odd number to see when it's one of these ones that's a core range. Um, Four million litres a year. From 1891 to 1898, it was owned by a man called Alexander Edward. Um, that was then sold on in, 19, in 1898 to Craigellachie Glenlivet Distillers. Now, this brings up a very interesting period of time for Speyside whiskies. Glenlivet Distillery is one of the first ever, in fact, it is the first ever officially licensed Scotch whisky distillery in 1823. It gained its license in I think it was the 24th of January, 1823, becoming the first proper licensed distillery. By no means the oldest. The oldest distillery in Scotland is Glenturret, as stands. Glenturret Distillery goes back to 1872, but they can, tra uh, they can tra sorry, 1772, but they can trace distilling on that site back to 1717, unbroken. It has closed subsequently back and forward since then. But when Glenlivet registered in 1823, it was by far the, the kind of the most respected and the biggest producer of whiskey in the Space Aid region. As a result of which, it got such a good reputation that everyone around them, rather than making what we now today would class as Space Aid whiskies, made Glenlivet style whiskies. So a huge amount of distilleries in Speyside would have, as this particular one had, Craig Elliki Glenlivet. Glenlivet was considered to be a style of whiskey, not just one distillate from a distillery. That in turn brought the Glenlivet to change its name to the Glenlivet, to try and identify itself as we're not Glenlivet style, we are the Glenlivet. Because Thank you very much, Kenny, because for a year I couldn't understand the idea of the names with the Glen Livid and the Dag Glen Livid. So thank you for making that clear for me for the first time. You are welcome. See, I do have a use. At last I've discovered that happy days. So that's that's very much where that comes from. It was considered a style. Now, if we look nowadays, there are still one or two bottles floating about that will have that. Glenlivet name on it. Uh, and I think, you know, when you look at the amount of people who have used that name over the years, you know, Glenlivet have been pretty patient with them, but they're certainly not suffering from it. Um, nowadays, there are very, very few distilleries that you will see that distillery stroke Glenlivet style thing. Um, but it does still occur from time to time, but that's very much where that comes from. So 1916, bought over by a man called Peter Mackay. He runs it perfectly successfully for years. And in 1964, the distillery is completely reconstructed and doubles its size to its now four, well, capable of doing four million litres a year, which is what it does nowadays. Again, the vast majority of this would go into blends, but it's really starting to, under Dewar's, well, it's now Bacardi who own Dewar's, but Alongside stable mates like Aberfeldy and Royal Brackla, it's really starting to grow a reputation of being a really interesting distillate. If any of you get the chance to come to Scotland, Craig Elliott is a place that I would definitely advise you to make a wee stop off at. And do not get carried away with the very fancy, lovely Craig Elliott Hotel. No, ignore that, because right over the road is the Heelander Hotel. And the Heelander Hotel is a much more basic drinking man's bar run by the most charismatic small Japanese man called Tatsuya, who's got the best collection of Japanese whiskey I will ever see in my life. 
go in, tell Tetsuya that Kenny McDonald told you to stick your head in. He will look after you well. That is a promise. Um, so this particular one is the only dram that we're looking at this evening, which has been uh, bourbon maturation. It's always nice, much as everybody loves these sherry maturations, it's lovely now and again to come up for air. And I think with Craigellachie, it's quite a delicate spirit. It's very easy to dominate that spirit with heavy oak by using this, first of all, um, bourbon for, again, a short finish. This is only about five months. It really puts down a nice foundation of gentle sweet vanilla. It's going to give you a slight white peppery note. And when you're dealing with anything that's been matured in white oak rather than red oak, it's not just how it tastes. This is Finnish ex bourbon. This is Finnish ex bourbon. Ex bourbon yeah. Finnish. So yeah, what's well, the first cast? It, it is, but what we did because this was always in bourbon asaf, but All it bourbon. was in. But this this was actually in a third refill bourbon cask. Mm -hmm. There was. Nothing in this. It looked and then like you changed it to first fill bourbon, and then and then we moved it into a first fill bourbon. So this idea of finishing in the same cast that it was matured in, a lot of people won't tell you. They'll just say first fill bourbon. But for me, that gives you the idea that it's been in that all its days, and it hasn't. So it's been a little bit, well, let's say flexible with the truth, kind of thing Donald Trump would understand. Um, Boris Johnson even more don't let me for start on these two <laughs> something stronger than Iron Brew um, but yeah I think it's important to give every whiskey drinker as much information as we can on how this has been matured and to say first fill bourbon it's not it's finished in first fill bourbon now what I was going to say there, if I'm drinking whiskey from, from red oak, from European oak, I'm going to feel the whiskey on my palate in a completely different way from if I drink whiskey that's been matured in white oak, American oak. Red oak, or um, Quercus robus, uh, is going, you're going to taste it right down the centre of your palate. And it, all the spices will run up and down the middle of the tongue. Those spices will mirror things like cinnamon and ginger and nutmeg, clove. When I drink from white oak, Quercus alba, we're going to get all the flavour on the side of the palate. It's going to run up and down the side of the tongue, tingle there, because that's where these white pepper spices come into play here. A huge amount of whiskies you'll drink will have been through both red and white oak. The, the classic double woods. If you've got double wood, you're always going to taste the red oak first, that European oak. And as it calms, the flavour switches and comes down here. So it's not just about what you smell, not just about what you taste, it's about how you feel. And that is what you get from this dram. Gregory, loving your comment. Thank you very much, mate. You've got great results uh, from the bourbon cask. You know, usually um, uh, people think that uh, uh, in Israel we have a sweet spot for sherry, you know, and, and this yeah, is yeah. something that will explode everybody's bubble, you know, because it's not typical for bourbon. The nose is, it's not sherry-like, but you have a lot of characters from, uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from, from the bourbon cask, but still it's not the same as. You know what I'm saying? Because I think that I the, 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 I still, the spirit itself is very dominant here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very, spirit, very, very spirit led. Yes. And I think, I think with a lot of bourbon expressions that we are used to as whiskey drinkers, meaning no disrespect to any whiskey out there, but they can be a little bit two dimensional. Yes, you know, exactly. Yeah. You know, and you go, well, it's, with the it's, here. Perfect. it's okay. But, but you know, it's, it's neither one thing nor the other. It means nothing to me. It's as neutral as drinking a whiskey is going to get. If you get this particular cask, this was a Buffalo Trace cask, and I love working with Buffalo Trace because it gives me a, a fruitiness coming out of it, which I don't tend to get from yeah. something like a... Yeah. 
Yeah. Adam B. Yeah, yeah, you're with me, Asaf, yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, all, with, all of us with you. I think if you can see the comments, if you can see the comments from the, uh, everybody say in Hebrew that this is the best one till now. Yeah. And I pretty much enjoy this because I'm, uh, uh, this is bourbon cask all the way for, uh, at the beginning, at the end, and all the sherry that we've been through all, uh, till now, and this is the best one, and this is bourbon cask both ways from the beginning till the end to the finish. Yes, we, we, we've done what we wanted. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. Yeah, but it, it's, and I agree, I agree with some of the things that people saying over here. Usually bourbon, you will have the kick of the vanilla flavors. You, you have you vanilla don't... here. You have vanilla here, but not. Yeah, but it's here. not, it's not dominant or something. Usually when you taste something that was really in bourbon, the you vanilla will you, be you the first thing vanilla. that. Kick in your nose. It's not that dominant over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, I agree. It, it's and to think that it was all the way in bourbon and still the vanilla Amazing. is not Amazing. kicking. It's interesting, and and I think that this is when the gland root is basically DNA come out because yeah. they're not letting the vanilla to take over. Which maybe well, it's me, but I'm gland root is. And Owen brought already a few bottles with Glenn Rudis, and they've always been a success. So maybe I'm already a biased, but. But, but you know what? I, you actually you use the exact word that is perfect for this, Ephra, and it's dominate. And I think when you're using, especially first fill bourbons, these are very active casks. You know, and if you let that go for too long, all you're getting is spicy vanilla. And there's nothing else there. Now, don't get me wrong, vanilla's a nice flavour. But but when you've got nothing else to go with it, it's a bit bland. You know, it's like having a bowl of custard on its own is just vanilla. But if you put something nice and fruity in there with it, oh yeah, now it tastes much better. Because for me, vanilla is a flavour profile that works incredibly well side by side with something else not just as this big domineering vanilla you know um and i think trigelichi as a spirit has got a really nice sweet fruitiness delicate fruitiness to it it's it tends to be kind of gentle green apple notes that come through it when it's a, a new make spirit um but as it grows that fruitiness kind of develops and this particular one, I just found that the sweetness, the, the fruitiness in there, it made sense to go to Buffalo Trace with this one because I thought that's actually not going to, it's not going to mask that fruitiness. It's going to draw that fruitiness out of it. And, and I think that's what we got. So can I just roughly say people are pleasantly surprised by this one? I will say, first of all, my mistake, it's a Craig Elke and not the Glenn Rudis, and I said Glenn Rudis. That's okay. But, but I will say, and I know some of the people over here better than others, that some of them, it's not kicking enough. For me, it's very much a summery, Israeli, easy, again, every person going to say if it is value for money, yes or no, but more of a daily summary whiskey and not something that I'm thinking about sitting and dwelling for a drum for two hours type of thing. Yeah. It's I, not I, complex whiskey for me, you know, but I, it's it's nice, it's tasty, summery, and have the kick of the alcohol in it, which is always yeah. good. And again, you know, you're saying it's easy. How often can you say that something at 56.8% alcohol is easy? You know, yes, you're 100% you're right. You do get the kick of alcohol coming through. I, If I was given this blind, I would never guess it was 56.8. Never. I know it's not 40%. I know it's it's up there, but not that strong. And that is, that's testament to how well it's been distilled. And then working the, the right oak with that distillate is going to give you a really good result. I'm really glad also that you mentioned, you know, it's a kind of summary drama. <coughs> Excuse me. As the hay fever kicks in. Um, 
that's that's allergy from not drinking alcohol coming out. <laughs> um, Dramor, we normally release four times a year at the moment. And it's done seasonally. So there'll be a spring, a summer, an autumn, and a winter release. And it's one of the things that I had a, a thought of through working around Europe and looking at how the brewers in Europe operate. Because there are certain beers that I love, say, for example, if I'm in the Netherlands, that I in the autumn I will be able to get um, a Bock beer, which is a kind of red ale. And yet, if I go back in spring, I can't get a Bock beer because they only make it for that season. And now I started to realise as I moved around Europe, they brew to the season. And it's different beers for different times. There are big, heavy, dark beers in the winter. There are really gentle, light beers in the spring and the summer. And I thought, why don't we do that in Scotland? Then I remembered we've only got one season. So there was no point trying to do that. But thinking on that made me want to try to do something similar with the releases of whiskey. Is don't bring out these big, heavy sherry bombs when it's going to be a hot summer's day. Bring out something that's light and floral and fruity and sweet and delicate. Because that's going to go for what you want on a hot summer's evening. Whereas when it's dark and it's cold and you want these big, heavy, sherry notes coming into play. Now, the trouble with that idea is not everybody drinks those whiskies at that time. I've just released them. So you get to drink the Christmassy ones in the middle of July and you get to drink these huge, big sherry bombs uh, or, or these delicate floral ones in the middle of a snowstorm. Doesn't matter. Um, but the one thing that we do manage to do by by releasing that way is bring out a massive spectrum of flavours rather than be this one-trick pony who just does big heavy sherries all the time. I know certain independent bottlers, all they do is bourbon. And that's the most boring thing I can imagine. There is a plethora of flavour out there. And what we've got to do as an independent bottler is bring all these flavours to you and then it's up to you to decide where you want to go. Not just tell you, this is how whiskey should be, drink it my way. Hell no. That's, that's not what whiskey's about. It's about you. It's not about me. So, thumbs up on the Craig folks. We had a few uh, notes. I like it. Mike, you were happy? Yeah, for sure. I'm from a bourbon lover, it was uh, very good. Yeah, it's um, spicy, and like the it. in the end, I really like it. Cool, no worries. Okay, so I'm happy with the clapping hands, Gregory. That's grand. I know it's worked for some of you. Again, it's never going to work for everybody. And, you know, one of the things that I, I pride myself with that I'm more about is what I said at the beginning. If the spirit is not exceptional, I'm not going to bottle it which is why we only do four releases a year. Um, if if I was to bottle okay or good whiskies, I could put three, four times the amount of whiskey on the market. But it's not as good as it should be. What I want when people see that label, that's not just a brand. That's a promise. That's a contract between me and you to say, What's in that bottle is as good as it's going to be. It's not always going to be to your flavour. I can't do that. What I can do is make sure that the quality is at that level, that it's always really good. But some people will love certain flavours, some people won't. There's nothing we can do about that. But so long as the quality is there, we'll just keep doing what we're doing. So moving on swiftly. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, we are moving on to the Glen Glasser before the secret, is that correct? No, no, no. We'll do the, I think we'll do the secret first. We'll do the secret We'll do now the secret drum. All right, okie doke. So let me just double check what we've got so that I know that I'm talking about the right thing. 
because don't there is say no... anything about it. Let's let people drink, say. Just clear your about palate. It. Drink water right now. Clear your palate. Okay. Uh, where are we going? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Nice. So this is where the roles are reversed. This is where you present a whiskey tasting to me. Now, unfortunately, I can't drink it with you. But what I'm going to do is take a wee seat back. Ah. And I'm going to relax for a wee while. And I'm going to finish my iron brew. And you're going to tell me about our mystery drum. Well, the, the nose is very, very fruity. Very light and refreshing. I love, I, I, I really love it. It's okay. sweet. It's bourbony. I mean, uh, by nose, I, I, I'd say it's... It's bourbon by color. It's definitely bourbon. Okay. And uh, then you just drink it. And it bursts in uh, into lots of uh, yellow fruit. A different, uh, a bit apple-y, like these yellow apples with the, with black dots on them. Yeah. A some kind of pear, maybe. Yeah, I get that. And like the only thing I can I can think about is man of more, because every time I I taste man of more, it's the same uh, exactly the same uh, sensation. But I'm uh, this time I'm not sure because man of more is my, uh, something much more solid in a uh, when you taste it. It's it's something I, I mean, it's a. Uh, it's very hard to 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 guess the the distillery, but uh, I really enjoy the rum because it's both very light and fruity and refreshing, and then again, it's comp it's a bit complicated. It it gives some bitterness in the middle of it, and uh, it continues to the finish. The finish in the beginning feels very short, and then. Then it uh, becomes longer somehow. I I, I just it's uh, it's very different uh, from uh, from the whiskeys I, I I usually drink, but mm -hmm. I like it. I like it very much. I I think you have you've described it really well, Peter. Uh, I'm I'm not going to tell you whether you're right or whether you're wrong about certain things. What what kind of <laughs> what kind of age would you say it was? It doesn't feel uh, very old. I mean, it's something a uh, ten to twelve, thirteen years maybe. Okay. By the com uh, by by the compl complicity of the of the tastes, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm, now I'm pretty sure it's uh, it's bourbon, like it's bourbon finish or bourbon cask. Uh, maybe. No, you know what? No. There's no way to turn or some uh, some uh, white wine. Uh, okay. It reminds me of uh, tasting the the whiskey in uh, Calvados, but uh, uh, but uh, I'm not sure here because like all the pears and uh, and uh, and and the yellow apples, it's usually Calvados, but here it's something else that I can't uh, can't uh, point it uh, right now. I, I love the, the introduction. Calvados is something I've used a couple of times. And it's a very, very difficult oak to work with. But when you get it right, it's stunning. Um, you can overdo it. You can overcook something in Calvados really, really easily. Um, but yeah, really nice notes, Peter. I enjoyed that. So thanks for that, mate. More, more. Right. We want more. So, Peter, you, you like it or you don't like it? It's good or not good? What do you what do you think? I want yes or no. That's it. Uh, I mean, I like it. Okay. I then, like, but then, uh, but I can't I can't say what uh, what kind of whiskey is this exactly. Okay. And, uh, I like it. That's the reason I like okay. it. 
we want to hear more, guys. What, what do you think about yeah, it? Like just, it? Don't like it? Uh, you drink, you buy it? You won't buy it? What do you think? The one thing that I'm just going to say to Peter is that Kenny, this tasting proved to us that color can be kind of a confusing. Mm -hmm. You say that the color immediately tell you is bourbon. Check the color of the first one, of the Ben Nevis 11. If you still have it in your glass, it's the same, almost the same color. Yes, exactly. And that was in PX and that was bourbon. So color I, I, now really confusing me in that aspect, I will say. What and do you think about this? What do you think about it? You like the it? First, the first sniff, I just got alcohol in my nose. So really? I just need to give it a little bit more of a time. It's interesting. It's complicated. I'm not as spoken as Peter to find the apples with the black dots on it. But we, we won't like it or not like it. I like it. I like it, but I think that it's something to give you the ultimate answer. I need it to be in the glass for a few more minutes. You're right. You're right. Okay, next. Yeah. We want more. I, more I think it, it's definitely heavier than than the Benevis, and it's much more complex than the previous one. And if I put it against the Benevis, so I think that it does have a, a better body, and it does have a, a longer effect in the afterwards and the Ben Nevis felt a little bit too light I think at the, the 11th one just like on the top like a little bit on the end and this one is different and I would I wouldn't say that it's, these are the same bourbons and you can really feel the difference what I do think, you think I'd, say, I'd place this as, as a second place uh, after second the, the place. Green okay <laughs> What do you think of the age of this shy? Sorry? What would you think the age of this would be? I think less than 13. I'd say somewhere around well, 9 to 11, maybe. But 11. Not, not 9, not 9. 11. I, okay. I, think it is, I think it is younger. I'd say something between 7 or 8. Um, also think it's a bourbon cast. It reminds me of, if I have to guess, Stuli Brindine or how or the way it it is uh, pronounced. I have no idea. Colabardin. So, yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, this is the. This it the was one. a good effort. It was a good effort. I, I I tried it a few times and it, it, I don't know why it reminds me of that. Uh, but yeah, I almost agree with Peter. I think it's a bourbon cast. Okay. Uh, yeah, really. Uh, again, spicy vanilla a little bit there, with a finish of white pepper maybe. Yeah, I also get the pepper in. Oak. What do you think? You like it or you don't like it? I like it. I, I even didn't add water. Okay, nice. Gregory Levitin. You're here, but you're not saying anything. What do you think? Like or don't uh, like? Yeah, I do like it. It's okay. nice. It's spicier yes. uh, than the previous one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's definitely been an uh, ex burn at first, but uh, I'm not sure about the finish. Uh, it's definitely something that I haven't drank before. Uh, Probably. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know. What, what it can be, but I think it's uh, it's younger than uh, 11, 12, 13. I believe it's about yeah. eight, seven years old. Feels mm -hmm. younger to me, and and it's spicier. And but I I do like it. Yeah. Sandra, what do you think? I also think it's a very young whiskey. But very young. Yeah. But you uh, like it? Maybe, maybe it's a bourbon finish. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, very nice for me. Very nice. Okay, cool. What about the brothers? We've not heard from those two for a wee while. Come on, lads. Tell us what you think. Well, Who doesn't like it? We both don't like it. You I both don't like it. Okay. At the start, the the the, the smell attacked the shit out of us. <laughs> uh, after we put some uh, water in it and we uh, waited a bit, the 
the taste became sublime. It's really, it's really sweet and uh, it's it's really full. But what what what? The the, the sweet and full. The the palate. The, the yeah the smell. But the taste itself, it's so. I would describe it as tough but restraint. Really? But yes, I, I would I, I would use the, the word um uh, unbalance. It's definitely wow, not really okay, for me. Okay. For me. Um I must say I don't think it's young. Uh it doesn't um attack me in a way young drums um attack you in in a terms of the the ABV. I don't think it is an high ABV, but not that high. I would say around uh, the middle 50s, I don't know, 53 or so. Um, not sure about the, the bourbon cask though, uh, but because it doesn't feel um, young for me, I would give it, I don't know, around 14 years, 13, 14. Um, but definitely not my kin, not my favorite. Uh, um, I would drink more of it, but it's not my favorite, definitely. Um, to you, a man after my own heart, even though you're not that fond of it, I would drink more of it anyway. Yeah. Well, we'll be, that we'll we that would like to be a professional alcoholic, so <laughs> we're, we're working to, uh, that, to, towards that. Well, what you've got to remember is I'm only 27 years old. Oh. That happens when you're a professional alcoholic, you know? I've got socks older than 27. We, we have some mileage to do then. <laughs> right, Asaf, shall we tell them what it is? Because I know that First of all, one, one, one person has done incredibly well here. I couldn't, hear you, I, I couldn't hear you. Could you repeat this one? I was saying, I know that, you know, looking through the different comments, mm -hmm. one person has done incredibly well. Yes, 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 yes. I'm trying to work out what this dram is. So but I can tell you this dram is not finished in bourbon. This has been a gentle power cartado finish. Exactly. Gentle. I can tell you it's 55% alcohol. Um, reaching, do we think, Space Highland, Lowlands, Campbelltown, Isla? Tell them, think? tell them, tell them which, uh, which one, which day? Highland. I know I can see faces going, what? <laughs> Someone's still in the running here. Age, a few of you got it right. Seven years old. Good effort. One of you even got the distillery. Even though, Mike, you couldn't quite pronounce it. This is a seven-year-old Tullibarton. Hats off to you, young man. Well done. Woo, Mike. Amazing. Really, really good effort. I was off the charge with the finish, but uh, <laughs> that's, that is, that's, that's amazing, good yeah. going. Now, um, I have, I, I've now bottled, I think it's five different Tillabartons. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is a phenomenally flexible spirit. And also one that comes at a really good price because as a whiskey, certainly in Scotland, it does not register as a trendy whiskey, as one of these whiskies that's a go-to dram for people. Um, it's got a strange kind of past. There was only the distillery itself has only been around since um, 1949, which when you drive past the distillery, it's in a small village called Blackford, just north of the city of Stirling kind of central belt of Scotland, uh, on the road towards the city of Perth. Um, you will see on the side of the distillery the number 1488. Now, that would make me think, wow, that's a really old distillery, which is what you're meant to think, but it's utter nonsense. So the story of the 1488 and the crown, which sits above the 1488 on the side of the distillery, is nothing to do with the distillery, but everything to do with the site the distillery is built upon. So this goes back to James II's coronation. Do you know, that's a lie. 
James the Fourth's coronation, um, before the unification of the crowns, back when Scotland was and should still be an independent country. So our kings would reside there. The, the royal residence was Stirling Castle. But to be coronated, to be crowned as king, they had to travel to an abbey of Schoon, just north of Perth. And in Schoon sat, sat the Stone of Destiny. Every single Scottish king and queen's coronation was held sitting on the Stone of Destiny. Subsequently, after um, Edward Longshanks stole Scotland um, following um, the capture and, and surrender, well, the, the Longshanks stole it after the, the Battle of Falkirk, and it was taken to England along with William Wallace. Wallace was executed, um, hung, drawn, quartered. His head was put on a spike um, just outside West, um, the Tower of London, and his limbs and torso were sent to the four corners of Scotland to be hung up to say this is what happens to traitors. The Stone of Destiny then resides in England from there on in until the 19, late 1950s, where a group of students... Um, from, I can't remember what university it's from, but I'll find out. I'm sure they were from Glasgow University, but I might be wrong. But a group of students in the middle of the night in an old beat-up van drove to London, broke into Westminster Abbey, stole the Stone of Schoon and drove back to Scotland with it. There was then a massive hunt trying to find where the Stone of Destiny had gone as the English were adamant it now belonged to them and must be returned, as from that day all their royal family have been crowned over the Stone of Destiny. Now, the stone was found and returned to Westminster. There was always rumour that that was not the real stone, the real stone stayed at home. But they've kind of checked it out, and yeah, it was the real stone that went back. Subsequently, in 1999, when Scott, the Scottish Parliament was first introduced, it was in, um, reopened. We hadn't had a parliament from 1707. In 1707 was the last sitting of the Scottish Parliament. And when they opened up again in 1999, it was as if they had never stopped. It was point of business on the first day of reconvening the Scottish Parliament. No big fanfare, no nothing. Back on my business. A couple of wee songs, but that was it. And one of the first points of order is, give us our stone back. And eventually the English had to return the Stone of Destiny, which now resides in Edinburgh Castle. Should have been taken, <laughs> but it sits in Edinburgh Castle now. When big ears get crowned a few months ago, sorry, King Charles III, not big ears. Um, you may tell I'm not a big royalist, um, when it was his turn to get a misfitting hat on his head, the English asked very nicely if they could borrow the stone again. I was dead against it, but it was smuggled out in the middle of the night to be taken to London so that a 72-year-old man could get a very expensive hat that didn't fit, put on top of his massive head, only for the stone then to be brought back the next day. So... This is why Tullibardin has got 1488 on its side, because as King James IV is going to his coronation, he is told by one of his advisors, Your Majesty, the best brewery in Scotland is in the village of Blackford. Why don't we stop? Yes, great idea. Let's go for a beer. So they go into this brewery, and the king is amazed at how good the beer he served is. So good that he buys every cask of ale that the brewery has. He left people behind so he could load up the carts with a sale. He is now a day late for his coronation because he spent that long in the brewery enjoying their wares. And he goes to the coronation with all the beer and apparently the party goes on for three days 
after his coronation until they have drunk Blackford's beer dry. The site of Tillabarden today is exactly the same site of that brewery. So although the distillery's only been around since 1949, the cheekily slap 1488 at the side of it is that's the date the king took all the ale. Nowadays owned by Picard de Vin, um, very much um, a French wine company. So you'll find a huge amount of Tullabardens are finished in Burgundies and Bordeaux and things like this. They really kind of specialise in, in wine finishes. But as I mentioned earlier, it's not it's not a big whiskey here in Scotland. It's not well marketed. It's not well publicised, which is a kind shame because it's actually a really good spirit. And when people do try it, nine times out of ten, people are genuinely surprised at how good a quality Tillabarden can be. Some people years Israel, old. People in Israel like to hate this uh, this whiskey. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I quite believe it. I, and I don't think that is unique to Israel, if I'm being honest, this yeah. I think it's one of these brands that is very, very easy to denigrate, to go, oh, Tillabarden? Oh, no, 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 no. And oh, yeah. The name of the, 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 they call it usually the gentle drum, could it be? Tullibarden? Yeah. Yeah. That's Tom in tune. Yeah. That's Tom in tune, Asaf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry about this. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Um, but I, I I have tried one or two Tillabardens from the distillery releases. I thought, yeah, that's quite nice. That's okay. But I, I don't think, as a French wine company, and it's purely my feeling on it, I don't think they really quite understand what they've got yet. Um, it's, it's a dram which is improving, for sure. And I think since Picard have taken over, the, the use of some of the wine casks has been brilliant. They've not been overly heavy with them, which is nice. Uh, and yeah, it's definitely starting to get a little bit of traction, but more through independent bottlings than distillery bottlings. So in general, as a Tillabarton, would you say you were surprised at this one? Shai's nodding. I'm happy with that. Yeah. Yeah, very much. Yeah. So this... I, I, will, I wouldn't guess it's, it's a seven years. No. no. Uh, I think we had um, Gregory and Sander as well got the, the youth in it. Um, personally, I, I think it, it masks its youth pretty well. I think it hides it pretty well. And I think it presents itself as a whiskey older than its years. Yeah. Which which is always a joy. And, you know, it, the age for me is no longer something that I have any real importance on as far as what I'm drinking. As a young man, and funnily enough, we had an interview yesterday and we were discussing this. The Scotch whisky industry has made, made a big mistake over the years by telling everyone if a whiskey is not at least 10 years old, it's not ready. It's not good enough. And we made that 10 years old the benchmark of this is what it must start at. Now, if I look at some of the young distilleries that we've got, the, the Lochleys, the Rassies, the Kings Barns, the Arnamurkins, stunning, really good spirit of really young ages, three, four, five years old, delicious drams. And I've had drams of 40, 50 years old, which are just like sucking on oak. There's just nothing left in them. So that number will give you an indication. It will give you a clue as to what you might expect. But it's not a guarantee. It's not a promise. And some of these young distillates that are coming out now are fascinating. And if you do see some of these young whiskies, grab them, try them, because they're bloody good, honestly. Right, two whiskies to go, and you won't need to get to your bed at some stage. So, I shall plod on regardless. And we are moving on to something, again, which is unashamedly young. And um, this one, even younger than the one you've just had. This is only six years old. And I think this proves my point, that if it's good enough, it's old enough. 
This is a six-year-old Glen Glasser. This one coming in at 56.1% and finished in the first fill of a Rotho Sherry. This particular dram for me gave me all the feeling or all the flavour of a sherry bomb, but with none of the weight. And the thing that puts me off a lot of these sherry bombs is it's a big, heavy, stodgy, chewy whiskey. Whereas this, the spirit was still delicate, elegant, light, but all the flavour of that Oloroso sherry was sitting in there. This is the fastest selling whiskey that we've ever released. This in Scotland and certainly in the European markets vanished like that. And within days of its release, a distributor's phoning trying to put another order in for more Glen Glasser. Like, not a chance. Gone. Finished. So, tell you a little bit about Glen Glasser Distillery. By far the smallest distillery that we're looking at today. Uh, Glen Glasser only put through a million litres a year, which is not a lot. Uh, very close to the village of Port Soy, in the very northeast of Scotland. It's 54 miles north of the city of Aberdeen. This has been on the go since 1875, established by a man called James Moyer. He ran from 1875 till 1892, mm -hmm. where Highland Distillers took over. Highland Distillers became part of what is now Edrington. A huge amount of these companies would amalgamate to become a much bigger body. Best example would be um, the Distillers Limited and Scotch malt whiskey, Scotch whiskey distillers who amalgamated to become the far, first part of what is now Diageo. Um, but Highland Distillers have now been absorbed into what is Edrington Group. Um, Edrington moved this on to a crowd called Scant Group, who very much used this as a packer going into drams like Cutty Sark and Famous Grouse, which was bought back for Edrington to create these blends. Um, the first malt from Glenglassa didn't appear till 2008. So Glenglassa is massively the new kid on the block when it comes to single malt names, considering the distillery has been about since 1875. 2013, it saw a massive kind of turning point for what Glenglassa could and would be. And it was bought over by a man called Billy Walker. Not just Billy. Billy had a, a conglomerate who moved in with him. Um, he had subsequently, just before this, bought Ben Rear and turned Ben Rear's fortunes on its head. And then the next one he went for was Glen Glasser. Now, Billy would run these distilleries through till 2016, but he sold Glen Glasser on to Brown Foreman. Now, Billy comes from the town that I'm sitting in today, the town of Dumbarton, where my father went to school. And on a visit to um, Glenallachie, which is now Billy's plant, Billy, when he sold these facilities, bought over Glenallachie and has subsequently turned Glenallachie into his head. He is very much the King Midas of the whiskey world. You know, we say in Scotland, that man could fall in the Clyde and come out with a salmon in his pocket. That's Billy. Everything Billy touches comes to gold. And in a meeting, you know, over lunch with Billy at the distillery, we got chatting and I didn't know he was from Dumbarton. I said, what age are you, Billy? And at the time he was 72. It's the same age as my dad. So what school did you go to, Billy? And that's a, that's a kind of hidden question in Scotland because it's to work out whether you're Catholic or Protestant. Because knowing what school you went to, we can instantly pigeonhole you as being one or the other. And we have still got certain religious issues. We're bigotry in Scotland when it comes to the two sides of the same coin. Anyway, Billy tells me, oh, I went to Knoxland Primary. So my dad went to Knoxland Primary. They were in the same class at school. So I had to send Billy school photographs that my dad had of Knoxland Primary School. And here he is sitting two rows down from my dad. Nothing to do with the whiskey. I transgress. My apologies. So this now sits 
in the the very powerful hands of Brown Foreman. Um, huge American company who've done wonders in the spirit world over the years um, with brands such as Glyndronach, for example. Um, just an interest, you know, when, when Billy sold his distilleries, this is only rumour, but from what I have been told, he walked away with a nice £92 million pound in his hip pocket. That was just for him. Not a bad day's work. Not for a for a wee boy from Dumbarton. That's no bad going. That's that's quite impressive. That might not be the right figure, but that's certainly the figure that's bandied around. Again, Glen Glasser has over the years, as we've seen, went on a, no single malt till 2008, massively been a pack up distillery all its days. The vast majority of Glen Glasser that has been released previously has been pretty much bourboned. But now they're really starting to up the game in different maturations and bringing out different styles and different ages. It's a distillery that a lot of people still haven't come across, to be honest, because the single malt is not one they've grown up with. It's not that traditional gantry whiskey that they'd be used to. But I think it's one that when people try, are very, very pleasantly surprised. For me, as I say, this has got all the the attributes of being that big Glendronach, that big sherry bomb, but with none of the weight. It's a gentle, delicate, elegant single malt whiskey. So, over to you guys. I liked it very much. Uh, I think it's top three from an, uh, in this evening. It's a sherry bomb, as sherry bomb should be. Not very sherry, not too sweet. In another few months in, in, in the barrel, it will be absolutely ruining my, I think, um, sweet. All everything that sherry brings to the table. In the end, there was a little bit of t- tobacco uh, notes, like a, a, like a, a pipe tobacco. Uh, I like yes, it very that, much. You it's see, it, that's exactly what it's like. It reminds me of when my grandfather had been in the room. And you knew he'd been in the room because there was just this very gentle tang in the air of his pipe tobacco. It wasn't the room filled with pipe tobacco, you know, it, but it was just that very gentle, delicate hint of that pipe tobacco. And it's a smell that when I do pick these notes up, and funnily enough, I get them quite a lot in some of the rums that we've released as well. When you do get that little bit of tobacco in there, as someone who's never smoked a cigarette in his life, never made a pipe, I have no idea what that kind of flavour is like. But that smell just brings me back to incredibly happy times. It, it's almost like somebody putting their arms around me when I pick up that hint. And that, for me, makes this dram more than acceptable, shall we say. I find this a really, really enjoyable dram. Because it, it's the sort of whiskey that I think we don't really get anymore. I think it's a throwback to whiskies of the past. Because you don't get that dry, rich, tobacco-y, polished oak. You know, a slightly furnisher polish, old leather settees, all these kind of old, opulent, dusty library notes coming through in a whiskey. These are these are flavors from decades ago, and people don't produce them anymore, which is a crying shame. But that's what we get. But delighted you're enjoying it, mate. I think it's a little bit, a little bit too sweet. I think that it it, it needs a little a- bit water to um, uh, to open up. I think that? That, I think that most of the guys here will like it because there is a sweet spot on the. Uh, uh, um, very dominant uh, uh, casks of sherry, and I think this is on the uh, uh, on the border of. Be- if it will be a little bit more, it will be too much. It will. It, if it will be a little less, I think it will be better. I think for me at least, because I think that uh, um, for it to be um, uh, uh, more balanced, it needs more water. It's okay. because it's too sweet. It's becoming uh, uh, one dimensional. And I think that uh, uh, 
it needs a little bit more attention, more time, more um, uh, for it to open up. I I'm not sure that uh, uh, this as it is right now ca can be for me. For um, uh... that's okay. That's I, I, I totally appreciate that, Asaf. It, it's funny that you you're really kind of going in the sweetness, as this is all the author sherry, mm -hmm. and all the author is dry. You know, I, I would get it if it was the Pedro Jimenez side of things, but it shows you the sweetness which is inherent in the spirit from Glen Glasset, because the sweetness isn't coming from the oak. And again, this was a pretty weak refilled bourbon cask when we got it. Um, it it showed great promise as a spirit, but other than that, you know, as, as a straight spirit, it was lovely, but the oak influence was non-existent. Mm. Um, and then it went into all our awful this time. This one was just under six months. It was about five and a half months. On well, the first build, the Sherry on Orful, yeah? First build. Yeah. First build, yeah. yeah, yeah. And what we'll try and do with the short finishes, if it's a really short finish, you'll, you'll go with a first fill with that. That way, it leaves plenty in the cask to use again for a different spirit. Yeah. But this finish will be longer the second time round. Um, what, what we're really trying to do is get as much out of the oak as we can, especially Sherry oak, because it's incredibly expensive. Um, especially after oh, yeah, the, you know, the stupidity of Brexit, it makes it much, much harder to transport to the UK as well, uh, and more expensive for us to bring it over because of all the red tape for not being in the European Union. Um, so what you really want to do is get three good runs out of that cask before you give up on it. The first one will be short, three, four, five months, no longer. The next one will be maybe nine months to a year. And mm -hmm. the next one, we'll use it for a new make spirit to go in and just leave it because it's going to give us a little bit of character and flavour, but only this much. And what that's, new make spirit being quite aggressive, is going to really draw out what's left in that oak pretty quickly. Then we're going to have, very similar to, to these kind of third refill barrels with bourbon, it's a neutral cask. You're getting no flavour and no colour out of it. But what that oak is doing all the time is softening the spirit. And that's massively important. We need that to soften. Then that gives me a beautiful blank page to work with when the whiskey's of the right age for me to do something with it. This one, I, I would love to be able to show you a before and after with this one because it is night and day from before we put it in the other awful cask to when it came back out again. If you love these big sherry bombs, you're going to love this. If you don't, you're not. It's, you know, it's unashamedly. It is a sherry bomb in all bar name. So if that's not your thing, this one ain't for you guys. But if it's that's the kind of flavour that you like, yeah, you're going to enjoy this. So I found out that in a sherry bomb, there's two types. The one that have a bit more, um, both of them are sweet, but more of the sulfur filling and one that, that have less. And I'm not a big fan of the sulfur. And there is a little bit for me. I felt that there is in the aftertaste, a bit of adding water, which this is the only one this evening that I actually so far added water to. Uh -huh. They did a bit more gentle and- I agree with you. This needs and water. nice and smooth. That is, and seriously, so far we are already on the sixth one. It's the only one that I felt the need to fill, to add a little bit of water to it, to make it for me a bit more. I know that some people here love all this dirtiness in the whiskey. Over here, it was too much for me. That, that's, that's absolutely fine. and. I that what you've got to remember is we're dealing with a spirit that's only six years old as well. So at six years old, this has still got a lot of young aggression in there. Now, the, the idea of putting it in with this really heavy oil off with sherry cask was to temper some of that misgotten youth, to be honest. Um, which it definitely has done, it's, it's calmed it remarkably, but certainly a teardrop of water in there is going to, it, it, it's a whiskey for me that's got edges. And, you know, going back to what we had with the Ben Nevis Palo Cortado, it was similar where it had, it had sharp notes to it, which I really enjoy. Sometimes that teardrop of water will round off the edges. 
and it makes it much more easy to appreciate for a, for a broader audience rather than the, the people who do like this badly behaved child of the Dromor family coming at them screaming and kicking. But I'll say that I appreciate that you kept the cat strength as it is, and I'm adding the water and not the other way around. Yeah, well, well, that's the beauty, I think, of single cats. Yeah, it's, 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 it's entirely up to you what you do with it. And I am not one of these crazy people who gets overly precious about what people do with my dram, because the minute it goes into your glasses, your dram, not me. So, you know, if somebody wants to drink it with Coke, Drink it with coke. Just don't let me see you. Obviously, um, I'll have to go and lie down in a darkened room now that I've said that. But it's the most important thing for me is that when people buy whiskey, that they enjoy it. And who am I to tell them how to enjoy something? And this is something that, honestly, guys, as whiskey enthusiasts. We still allow people to do I like you. you. I like that opinion. You're absolutely right. And this is what Asaf and I are always telling that that's an experience. It's Elroy. not a mental type. Elroy. Yeah. We're, uh, be... we're a trio here. There, yeah. there is a very broad, a very narrow angle of the camera here. I'm sorry. Uh, it's okay. Yeah. My voice Look, is I, up. I, I'm actually on wide angle lens and I'm still taking up the whole damn thing. So ah. don't worry about it, guys. <laughs> so. This is exactly what we say, Asaf and I, and even the other Asaf, yeah, there are two of them here. It's a, uh, it's multiplying. <laughs> and the thing is, it's exactly what we say. Who are we to determine to the other person how to drink his drink? It's a fun thing. It's something to enjoy. It's something to have the way you love it. If you want it chilled, enjoy chilled. If you want it hot, enjoy it. If you want to add water, you want to downsize it to 20 uh, uh, percent alcohol to 10 percent i don't know open your bottle for 20 years let it dissolve and enjoy it that way enjoy it so i really appreciate the way you think and thank you for that you're more than welcome sir and um you know i i love the attitude i love that attitude it's exactly right and do you know you have st there is still this school of thought that you must drink it this way. You can't do this. And the way I've always tried to compare it to is if, if I walked into a restaurant and I sat down with Victoria and, and the waiter comes over and says, um, what would you like, sir? I'll have I'll have the ribeye steak, please. Wonderful choice, sir. That's great. I'll just take a note of that. How would you like your steak cooked, sir? Uh, well done, please. <gasps> what? So, what? Sorry, sorry what? Uh, I'd like it well done, please. Uh, oh, no way. No. We can try this. No. Try again. Try again? Yeah, try again. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I don't know, meet you? No, what? no. You'll have it rare. <laughs> now, I would never, ever, ever allow someone to tell me how to, as it was, I would have it meet you. But, Mm -hmm. I would never allow someone to tell me how to eat my food. And yet we still allow people to tell us how to drink our drink. And it's ridiculous. You know, a lot of this stuff, if it goes to China, they will mix it with green tea, for God's sake. <laughs> Why would you? I don't get it. But all that matters at the end of the day is they've enjoyed it. And huh? it's made for people to enjoy no. Yes. Some people enjoy football. Some people, <laughs> some people enjoy <laughs> walking in the rain. Some people don't. We all enjoy different things. And never once in any ah. other day of life do we let someone <laughs> tell us. That's, it's a bugbear of mine. So whoever <laughs> <laughs> won't enjoy these drams, that's how you enjoy it. I can't, I can't uh, uh, mute, guys, because I'm not the host. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. That's allowed. That's allowed. You know, so, Kenny, Kenny, the beautiful thing is that some people say, like, for me, this uh, Glenn Glasso is way too sweet. Yes. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, and I, yeah, I know. And I just got a private message for somebody that uh, wrote to me, Asaf is wrong, I must get a bottle. <laughs> uh, and it's, that's, that's the beauty. beauty. Wrong. It's my opinion. That's the beauty. That exactly. Everybody needs, everybody has to find what he likes. You, you know, know, by I, the way, that's, for, that's me, the way the for me, this is the daily ground. Because I Which don't have one? to think anything. When I drink it, I don't have to think anything. It's just weak. Which? The Glen Glasser? Yes, this Don't one. worry, you never think anything, Asaf. I can't <laughs> drink, I, I, I can honestly don't, can't drink it. Way too sweet for me. But I know yeah. the people that would love it, and I can offer it to people that like it. This so, is, this is only the problem. But I think, see, when, when, you're, when you're broaching the subject of these big, bold flavours, mm -hmm. they're only going to tick the box for a certain amount of people. Yes. And the one thing I've got to be very mindful of when we are bottling, when we're looking at how to finish casks, how to do X, Y, Z, I've got to try to put something out for everybody. Mm -hmm. And, there are, you know, and it might not be, it, it may well be that that is a, a small group of fanatics who love these things. Not a problem. I will make that whiskey for these people. Perfect. And this is amazing. It, it, you know, if, and if it's not for you, you know, you look at it and go, nah, that's not my kind of whiskey. I'll go for the Craigellachie. I'll go for the Benares, whatever direction you're going to go in. But it allows me to put very, very different flavour profiles on the table and go, whichever one works for you guys. Okay. And, you know, I said, you're 100% right when you said you're not wrong. Because it's something that I said right at the very beginning. There are no rights and wrongs. Just because you like something doesn't mean everyone else has got to like it. And just because you don't like something doesn't make the guy who loves it wrong. We all appreciate different flavours, different smells, different experiences. So, but we, but we get incredibly precious when it comes to whiskey. And that's when the finger pointing starts. Well, you don't know what you're talking about. That's rubbish. <laughs> no. Crazy. We wouldn't do it in any other walk of life. And yet when we sit and we talk about one thing that we've all got a passion about, I'm the only one that knows what's going on and the rest of you are all idiots. Yes. You know, we, we, we lose the ability to rationalise with each other because there's a drama in my hand and I'm going to defend it to the death. <laughs> and you're like, calm the fuck down for God's sake. Just chill out and enjoy the drama. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Don't like it, pass it to the guy next to you who's going like this with his glass to get the very last drop. <laughs> That's the way it goes. Well, we have one more dram, folks. Yeah, before you, you will uh, 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 introduce the, the next drum, uh, I'll say something in Hebrew so people will. Uh, Let me see if I can share it on another show. I know I'm a Tralu Bay stream, but I'm from Arbaisre. Tisha or the Sophish one of Ta. I'm taking off my clothes at the end, so I'm... Uh... <laughs> what's, the, what's the difference from every other night? I'll, I'll be honest with you. See, when I said that there is no such thing as wrong, that's just wrong, mate. <laughs> Well, there is, there is. That's, then there wrong. Uh, that's wrong, that's wrong. If you start, I'm going to start. And if I start, I'm going to frighten the children. Yeah. Don't go. <laughs> Don't go. Right. I guaranteed, now that I've got that mental thought in my head, when I'm finished this, I'm going to have to go and get a drink. That's for sure. Thankfully, you guys have still got one drama in front of me. Okay. So, no, I'm not one. Last drama of the evening, ladies and gentlemen. This has been a monster session. We're now over two hours. But I hope I hope it's something you've enjoyed. Most of you have managed to stay the course. So hats off to you for that. I'm impressed. We are going to go to, for the last drama this evening, we are going to go to Loch Lomond Distillery. Loch Lomond Distillery is, I've got to be honest, not the prettiest distillery you're ever going to see. Uh, built in 1965 in an area of Alexandria called Rosshead. 
Ross Head is one of the most deprived areas in Scotland. It's an incredibly poor area. Um, and Loch Lomond Distillery sits behind massive fences, walled in. It is very much, for me, the Willy Wonka of the whiskey world. You never see anyone go in. You never see anyone come out. It produces millions of litres of incredibly different whiskies. It can create 11 different new make spirits in its own site. It's got its own cooperage. Everything other than the malting happens in that behind those fences. And funnily enough, the people who do, do come from around Ross Head look a bit like Oompa Loompas. So it ties in beautifully with the whole Willy Wonka and the chocolate factory look. The history of Loch Lomond distillery itself dates back to 1814, but it was nowhere near its present site. It was in a village of Tarbot, which is right at the very top of Loch Lomond. Loch Lomond itself is the largest body of fresh water anywhere in the UK. It stretches for just over 26 miles long and is seven miles at its broadest point. It's also incredibly deep in places, but it houses within the loch well in excess of 100 islands of varying sizes. There's only one of them which is inhabited, which is known as Inchmurrin. Inchmurrin has a hotel, it has a small marina, and bizarrely, one thing I can never quite get my head around in Scotland, a nudist colony. Now, I'll be honest, the weather in Scotland is not exactly what I would be looking for, for a nudist colony. And even on a nice day, for those of you who have been to Scotland, you may have been unfortunate enough to meet a local inhabitant of these lands called the Midge. The Midge is the nastiest, most vicious, tiny little fly which can give you a pretty nasty bite and always turns up with 10 million of its friends. So the one thing you do not want is to be naked when these damn things are around. So hats off to the individuals who go to the nudist colony on Inchmurrin. In Loch Lomond Distillery, they, as I say, create 11 different new make spirits. They will create, they've got so many different stills that it defies logic between column stills for their grain, between an absolute Frankenstein of a still, which is a pot still with a column still on top of it. It's, it's a fascinating place to see. And even their wash, when they're making the beer that they're going to distill, they've got numerous different strains of yeasts that they'll use, different fermentation times for different drams. The one that you've got in front of you this evening, ladies and gents, that we're finishing off with, is Inch Fad. Inch Fad comes from the name of one of the islands in the loch and is the only peated expression that we're going to have this evening. Um, they will do a couple of peated expressions. Croftenga is the other one coming out of Loch Lomond. But for me, Inch Fad is by far the, the best example of a, a Highland peated, well, Loch Lomond is a Highland distillery, but technically the peat we would class as Lowland peat. Very, very different from the peated expressions that you'll be used to from places like Isla, for example, where you'll have that really kind of strong medicinal note coming through the, the Lothroigs, the Lagavulins and the Arbegs, the, the three peat giants of Isla. Slightly more calm in things like Colilas and, and Colcommons and Bowmores, but still very much there. The, the peat from Isla is very phenol, so we get these notes. The peat that we get from Loch Lomond is very soft, it's very gentle. So it's much more smoky, almost like a bonfire smoke, resonating through the whiskey rather than that heavy medicinal note. This particular one... Um, we have finished in, and I'll get it right this time, Amontillado again. Look at me. Look how I learned. Yes. Um, and this one is the oldest drama of the evening as well. This one's coming in at 15 years old. I'm um, still sitting 52.3, but it's starting to get to that mellow stage. And I think for me, at, at that strength, with this style of peat, with a gentle Amontillado finish on top of it, I, I always find the fruitiness in sherry, 
brings out the smokiness to its best. I love that mix. And it's pretty much sweet and peat. Sweet and peat work really well together. That fruitiness and the smokiness have a tendency to wrap themselves around each other. They marry together, which means when you try that dram, the, the balance which is in there is incredibly good. So that, ladies and gents, is the last drama of the night. I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you thought of it. I hope that through the evening, I've shown you a lot of very different creations that, that, we've, that we've come up with. Um, I hope that for every distillery that we've been lucky enough to work with, that we've shown it respect, that we've um, been very considerate with the spirit that's in there. And I hope out of the seven drams that you've had tonight, there is at least one or two in there that you've thought, oh man, that's for me. And if one of those is for you, again, I started with it, I'll finish with it. Please remember that if you go to Oren's website, um, which is alphabetwhiskey.com, you've got that Dram 20 code where you're going to get 20% off this evening. Use it. It's not that often somebody gives you 20% off a bottle of whiskey, especially single cask cast strength drams. So before I hand over to you guys to hear about, actually, you know what? No, let's hear what you think of the inch fad. Let you tell me what you think. This is so not Isla whiskey. No, no. So th th this is this is very pity, uh, um, but you don't have the uh, marine notes that you have from the Isla. You don't have seaweed. Oh, yeah. You don't have saltiness. This is so different from what we um, uh, usually have. This is this is amazing. I think that uh, also again the Montiado cask is giving us. A lot of um, uh, good notes that uh, add up to the uh, smokiness and the bitterness. I also think that uh, um, there's some kind of, uh, uh, I get these notes here, from uh, uh, maybe some kind of charred oak or something like this. Could it be? Could it be? Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. Um, the cask was pretty heavily charred. Um, and so this is a combination. This is perfect, I think. Charred yeah. oak. I, and, uh, it brings me back to that kind of bonfire. Feel yeah, that I always get from low and heat. Now, if you've if you've got that bonfire, that smell is coming from charred wood. Mm -hmm. That's where we're getting it from. So to just accentuate the smokiness a little bit, the the cooperage, and I know the boys who work in the cooperage at Loch Lomond. I I can literally walk from where I am to Loch Lomond Distillery. It will take me a little bit of time. Don't get me wrong, but you know a good fifty minute walk, and I'll be at Loch Lomond Distillery. Um, and I know a couple of the boys who work in the cooperage. So when we were putting this together, we'd taken the cask down to them. And I'd said to them, listen, can you do me a wee favour, lads? Can you just give that a sear for me? I know that by doing that, we're not going to lose the Amontillado because it's seeped into the wood. All they're doing is just put another extra coat of char. And it's literally seconds with a huge flamethrower. And once that's done, it seals everything in. Then we degorge the, the bourbon cask it was in into the Amontillado. And from there on in, the oak and the, the peatiness which has been left in that spirit does its work. And I think the balance in it is just sublime. I think uh, it's a really great drum. Uh, definitely my favorite. Uh, the smoke, the sweetness, just uh, the percentage, just uh, to the point. It's a great drum. Definitely the best of the evening, in my opinion. Thank you very much indeed, Sarah. I really appreciate that. Thank you. I just think that it's not fair to compare it to the other six to some extent. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's, just, it's so thank you. different. It's just, I, I, yeah, I don't you have the six you that are You can compare You can compare the six have some things in common, something in that you can compare, even the cask or the side. The worst this in my is, it's, it's so different. It's at a different scale. It's like you gave us some sort of a, and some people know that I'm not a big, I need to have a specific type of, of, of smokiness to like. And this one with the sweetness, it's great, but it's a different, it's a different 
box. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and you know you're 100% right. Uh, it, it, when you do bring something which is PT to the table, but yeah. obviously we always leave these to the last drams for the obvious reason, because you're going to be tasting this in half an hour's time. You know, so, uh, Zach, if you would have said, okay, let's do a tasting of whiskeys that all of them been in a PX, all of them had a finish in Oloroso, all of them had the same finish, some of them smoky, some of them not, that I can understand. Over here, between the six that we have different barrels and, and everything, and different distillers, but and this one, it's it's really stand out on a different scale, on a different stage. So to do, compare it to the rest, you can say it's what okay. you like, but you can it's it's a little bit problem to compare them. You say that you like this more than the others, but you can it's, compare this one to a sherry bomb. Because of course I can. I'm of saying I, I like it in a different scale. Oh, if I need to put the other six, I will grade them between one to six. The in the inch whatever fed because uh, I cannot even inch pronounce bad. the name correctly. Inch <laughs> bad, yeah, correct. <laughs> it's 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 different. It, it's, it is, and I, I think it's like you did but, a whole meal of different types of I don't know what, and you gave me a, a dessert or or yeah, a I, steak, I think a yeah. whole meal of dessert. The first, <laughs> first six the, 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 yeah, the, the first six all had. There was a commonality ran through them all, you know, and you could, although they're very different casks, very different weights and styles of spirit, you you can wave one off against the other. Uh, I understand that. And then when you do throw in this PT drama at the end, where you get think, charred meat coming I off. I think it, just to comment on on a uh, um ideas that if you put that against the uh, six or seven other desserts, for some reason, I still think it would be one of the top. For some reason. It's in a total different level than the... You like, you like more PT than the uh, bourbon cask. Or because usually you like with it. No, it's okay, it's fine, it's perfectly fine. But again, it's like comparing a cake to a steak. Some people don't like cake. Some people also like chocolate. Um, uh, on, uh, Asaf, bread. We're not comparing. We're telling you, the inch fat is the winner. It's the creme de la creme. <laughs> fine, fine, perfectly fine. I agree with that. <laughs> Everybody can agree with it, but it's, there's, it's a different scale. Like yeah. it, it's, it's a very, very different scale. It's yes, a very too, too, in, in, instead it's like, special taste, this, but again, definitely different from the others. Yeah. But for my test, it's exactly a, what. If you really want exactly to get an, what answer, it an honest answer from tonight, it's to ask people put number seven aside, one to six, how you grade them. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, Never the mind. That, if you ask me, I, 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 I got it. Having, having been across you know, to Israel before and, and conducted whiskey tastings around the country, I, I know that there is. Certainly, and it's strange because every country you go to, there are different kind of trends and, and flavors. And in Israel, I've always found the PT expressions have gone down incredibly well. Always, I don't know why. I don't know if it's climate. I I, I don't know if it's diet. I don't know, I don't know why as well. We don't have that long of a winter over here. <laughs> uh, you have the call, Ila. It's a great expression, also. Khalil is marvellous. I, I love that bottle. Uh, it's a distillery, again, kind of similar to Loch Lomond, where it's not the prettiest. There's another 1960s monstrosity, although they've done a lot of work with it. Um, but I don't think there has ever been such a thing as a bad Khalila. I, I think it's a phenomenal distillery. Well, the same opinion as you, Alex. There, there, are, there are more Khalilas to come from us, I can tell you that. Um, I've got a few sitting in the warehouse. They're not ready yet. But the beauty with Kalila, uh, when it comes to actually in general Isla whiskies, they do incredibly well young. And for me, the best years of Kalila are five to eight. And uh, then, Oral and brought then, the six. It wasn't. Uh, it was good. And and then twenty five to twenty or thirty. You know, it, it's the, the extremes. 
very young, or very old. The, the stuff in the middle is great. But see when it's got that youth about it, there is just something that is mesmerisingly good. This is a very different creature uh, because you don't have that, that phenol element coming into play. But what you do have is a very memorable dram. Uh, and I think, you know, if that's probably right, where as far as a vote goes, we should probably look at what your favourite of the first six are. Because I think otherwise it's going to be pretty much a landslide the way the comments have been going. However, that's not for me to decide. What I will do before you go to your scoring, and I'll hand you back over to Asaf to deal with that, is I will give you from the very bottom of my heart a massive thank you for allowing me to waste your Thursday night listening to my utter nonsense. But no, 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 no. At least I gave you a few no, 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 no. the pain no, no, no. Oh, you can do this. Thank you, Kenny. Hey. hey. We, we, we invested our Wednesday night to listen to you. We invested, not wasted. That was it. That was the You know, not all the day. It was on vacation. Thank, thank you. This was fascinating. And we want to thank you all in the name of South Coast Whiskey Society and all the guys that are here. I think that... Uh, uh, you gave everything that you could and more for this. And I think that uh, we everybody is appreciating it. And uh, thank you for this. Thank you for the time. Well, well time. listen, guys, you thank know, you I, I, I'm going to be across in Tel Aviv for Whiskey Live. If anyone's got the opportunity, come and see me. Because it's always much more fun for me to be able to share a drama in person with you. And that I would love. So please, if you have the availability, if you're going to be in town, I know you guys are a good distance away, but if you can come and see me. I... Don't worry, they're all coming to Whiskey Live, Kenny. Don't we... worry, I will you be there be on the normal. first day. And and guys, 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 don't ask Kenny if he's a real Scotsman. <laughs> please don't ask him when, he is, uh, when you meet him in Whiskey Live. In, in fairness, the, now, I did have one fright the very first time I was across. Um, I was working at the time. I was doing some work for one of my biggest clients, which was Ian McLeod's for Glen Goyne. And I was sent across, right? You're going to Tel Aviv, Whiskey Live. Okay, fine. And I am notorious for everywhere I go wearing my kilt when I'm working. And I went, well, what, what's the venue going to be like? Oh, it's, it's in this stunning big shopping mall it's, it's a big exhibition area i thought all right okay so that sounds okay that's going to be air conditioned that's fine so on goes this seven and a half kilos of lamb's wool wrapped mm -hmm. around my waist with a big woolen socks and a crisscross ghillie shirt and another few kilos of lamb's wool as a big heavy waistcoat goes on oh. and away i go 36 degrees, no problem to me, I'm going to be fine. And the young lad who's looking after me gets me to, to the lift. He goes, ah, it's upstairs, right, okay. And we jump in the lift and up we go and the doors open. I think, oh, dear God, it's the roof. <laughs> We're on the roof. No cover, no nothing. I'm dressed up ready for a snowball fight and it's 36 degrees. Now, for you guys, 36 degrees is fine. That's, that's easy. For Scottish people, that's not weather. We cook things at 36 degrees. <laughs> Setting on our oven. Anything over 24 degrees, we start to panic and look at each other going, He's throw. He's throw. <laughs> there is nothing funnier than seeing a Scottish person in anything over 30 degrees because it's just blind panic. We don't know what to do. And especially when I'm dressed up for a Scottish winter. Now, I'll be honest. This time get, we have aircon. It was it's not. Closed, it's closed venue with an aircon. Don't worry. This, this year, I'm yeah. Trusting you, Oren. I am trusting you. <laughs> no, uh, venue, trust me, I wouldn't go there on the roof again. Right, because I mean, this is how. And I'm wearing it. pants. But when I took that kilt off and threw it in the corner, it was no. like throwing a wet towel against a wall. It I'm was. Well, no, 
a pretty sight, that's for sure. No, 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 no. I was, I'm, I'm wearing trousers and I wouldn't go on this roof again. <laughs> so it's a closed venue with aircon. Uh, and don't worry. Right, the kilt's going on then. Good the kilt. Uh, obviously, I, it's now at the stage lockdown was not kind as I sat on my fat ass doing this for nearly two years. So there is slightly more of me than there used to be. And I was never the skinniest guy to start with. <laughs> so I have now got that big belt that goes round the kilt with a big silver buckle. The amount of tension and stress in that belt is astronomical. Never, when you meet me wearing a kilt, stand directly in front of me. Because see if I breathe out, that buckle is coming off at light speed. So all the stuff on either side of me is the only safe way to go about it, guys. Thank you, Kenny, for a lovely, a lot, lovely Kenny. event. Listen, guys, I am going to, I'm going to love you and leave you. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed the night. I certainly enjoyed my night. And that's not something I would normally say, drinking iron brew. But I've thoroughly enjoyed myself, guys. So until the next time, and I very much hope there is a next time, I will see you soon. Cheers, Kenny. Thank Thanks. you, Kenny. Nice. Thank you very much, Thanks Kenny. Very much. Thank you very much. See you again. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Cheers. Bye.